Turkey is back on the map as a major player on the world stage, thanks to Erdogan's leadership. The president wants to step down, and he's been quoted as saying, the results that will come out will be the transferring of a legacy to my siblings, who will come after me. What does this mean? A hereditary empire? And what has been his legacy over the past 20 years in office? Join me, Jan Daras, on how we got here. Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the man who has been at the helm of Turkish politics for two decades, recently announced that the upcoming municipal elections later this month would be his last. The result we receive on March 31st will undoubtedly give support to us, will give power to us, will push us to enhance the country's position in the world. Erdogan first came to power as Turkey's prime minister in 2003, serving for 11 years before becoming president in 2014. He has made his mark on Turkey by pushing several major projects to transform the country, including plans for a 45-kilometer-long shipping canal known as the Canal Istanbul, which would provide an alternative route to the world's busiest waterway, the Bosphorus Strait. But the project raises some serious concerns. During the first decade of his tenure, Turkey's economy observed high growth in GDP, accompanied by the emergence of a new middle class. But more recent years have seen persistent high inflation. Erdogan's ambitions, however, don't stop at Turkey's borders. He has often expressed aspirations toward neo-Ottomanism to restore Turkey's influence over the territories which once made up the Ottoman Empire. With another four years left, the public also questions Erdogan's recent remarks regarding siblings being his successors. Despite the concept not being unfamiliar in global politics, it might simply indicate plans to pass the baton to his political allies. Joining us now is Adam Bihalski a research fellow at the Department for Turkey, the Caucasus and Central Asia at the Centre for Eastern Studies. Welcome to the programme. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you. Um, now, President Erdogan has uh, said that he's going to... This, this, this current uh, impending election will be his last campaign. Should we believe him? Is, is he just going to be a Frank Sinatra... Um, enduring farewell tour. Can he actually mm. do any practical means of securing a, a, a future, or does he actually mean it? Well, I think that there's two kind of radically different answers which you could give to this uh, question. One is that obviously Erdogan can hold on to power for as long as he wants. He has... So a, by, by what? By altering the constitution? Or well, actually, the current even constitution gives him the ability to essentially run for a third term because, for example, there's a little you know, extra line paragraph within it which says that if you have early elections, you can essentially run for a third right. time or something like that. At the same time, Erdogan has been talking about a new constitution, arguing that the current constitution, which he already has changed once, or actually, no, two times, is still the old constitution from the previous era of the uh, you know, Kemalist generals, which were autocrats and everything, and we need a new civil constitution. And in that constitution, you know, if he was to actually rewrite it, once again, the term limit would have been reset and he would be able to, you know, at least stand two more times sure. as president. So uh, if he wants to hold on to power, my argument is that Erdogan has all, uh, all the tools necessary to do that. But there is a second uh, answer that I can give, which is radically different. I mean, Erdogan is, of course, approaching his limits when it comes to, you know, being able to run a country for 20 plus years. And he has to think about how he's going to secure his legacy and most importantly, how he's going to pass on power to somebody else, somebody he can trust. I mean, he's built this great Turkey today with this, you know, multi-vector foreign policy, uh, something of that I think he's very much proud of that has really placed Turkey in the spotlight. And he would like to find somebody who'd be able to, you know, continue this legacy without, of course, destroying what he yes. has built right now. And that's a very tough thing. So I assume that he really might mean that he wants to step down. Uh, but it's a matter of fact, it's a, it's a question right now whether, whether he will be able to find somebody who can, you know, fill in his shoes. How would, how would that person look? Would it be a, a person of his close... 
<coughs> court, family, how would, when he thinks about his, his uh, legacy, uh, I does, think he, does he have an image on, on whom to pass? Um, this really depends, I think, on the personality of a person. Uh, of who is he looking? I mean, the obvious answer would be preferably somebody from his family or from his kind of close background. But that person also has to have this kind of um, allure as a politician who's, um, progress, who's progressing the country forward. I mean, Erdogan has built his image on this idea that he has uh, took this rather kind of torn to pieces Turkey from the previous uh, elites and governments that were prior to him. And he's built this new majestic great Turkey that, you know, has a space program, right? Is able to conduct military operations abroad. And so he wants to have somebody who would have the same charisma as somebody who can cons portray himself as moving the country forward, developing its technological means, its production means, its autonomy, its ability to conduct its foreign policy in a way that no other government has been. And I think he's not necessarily looking for somebody he can trust as much as he's looking for somebody who has that charisma that he has till today. And this is one of the biggest problems that I think that Turkish foreign policy faces is that there really isn't somebody who can meet these criteria. Is his vision of Turkey um, one that has been repeated? For example, I'm thinking of Kemal Ataturk, who took a, an ailing Ottoman Empire and reformed it. Uh, is, that, is that a phase that happens in, throughout Turkish history where it goes... Um, goes into a, a, a <clears throat> relative decline, and mm. then you have these young Turks, literally, who, who step in. Well, I'm, I'm not that much into foreseeing the future, but I absolutely agree that um, as much as Ataturk was a man of his time period who created, you know, the modern Turkish history and the modern republic and really became the icon and the founding father, father of it, I completely agree with the fact that Erdogan today is a complementary father to the Ataturk project. Uh, as much as Ataturk was a Republican uh, who created the foundations of, you know, the previous kind of decades, Erdogan kind of took that forward and, you know, not only rehabilitated the taboo topic of the Ottoman Empire, which the Ataturkists and the previous governments were absolutely yeah. unwilling to touch on because they're considered as backward topics, Erdogan has taken the Republican kind of establishment of, you know, the nation state that Turkey is today, that, uh, that Ataturk has created. But he's also given it this kind of pride in its history, uh, in its roots in the Ottoman Empire. And that has, I think, created or complemented Ataturk's vision with Erdogan's vision of, you know, an Islamic nationalist or, you know, nation state kind of country. And so I think it's a very interesting mix. And it's true that Erdogan is appearing a hundred years later after Ataturk and he's complementing the image. And the question is, are we going to see another third, perhaps a very kind of pronounced president or, you know, a figure appearing in Turkish politics? And I think that this is the big question. Nobody actually really knows. Erdogan arose out of nowhere. Same as Ataturk. I mean, Ataturk was a general who nobody knew prior, yes. prior to World War I. Uh, Ataturk. Very successful general. Exactly. And, and Erdogan was a, a child of a, you know, a fisherman uh, from Riza. So, who came to Istanbul, one of the poorest districts, and, you know, out of nowhere, he also kind of appeared later on, you know, grow. So what... Uh, you mentioned this imperial Ottoman uh, background. Are there any uh, models or any um, templates that he sees himself as? For, for example, uh, Vladimir Putin sees himself as Peter I, Peter the Great. Are there any Ottoman... Um, examples that, that he uses as a guide to, to his vision for Turkey? Well, when answering this question, I wouldn't say that mm, Erdogan sees himself as perhaps a here to the Ottoman legacy. Rather, he appreciates that Turkey once was an empire and that it has a lot of, you know, soft power in both the region, uh, both being, you know, once the center of Islamic culture, that he can use to, you know, kind of stretch his power and present himself as, you know, this country that suddenly has far more um, potential to discuss with not only its relations with the Western states, but suddenly, you know, be a key actor in the Middle East. 
in the Caucasus, in Central Asia, the old in Africa. Grounds, yes. uh, so, so I think that what Erdogan has taken himself is he's not really positioning himself as a here, as you know, some people say the next sultan or something like that. No, he's very much a Republican a statesman, just like Ataturk was. There's nothing, I think, in terms of that, in terms of Ottoman, in terms of Ottoman Empire. But he's really taken back some of the essential ideals that you know Turkey is no longer this kind of Western island that just does whatever the West says, like it was during the Cold War. Right now, it's a huge autonomous actor, kind of like the Ottoman Empire back when it was, of course, at its peak, and it's conducting its own foreign policy. And I think that this greatness, this idea of being this here to the Ottoman Empire as a new republic, as a completely new formation, I think that definitely gives him this kind of idea that Turkey should be something more than what it was, let's say, two or three decades ago, that it should be active, that it should be exploring all connections and relations with everybody, not just the West. The idea of the, uh, the soft power is, is, uh, is also a British idea about the Commonwealth and how Britain can punch above its weight. Is that uh, policy for Turkey actually successful in these areas that you mentioned, the Caucasus, <clears throat> Middle East, uh, Southeastern Europe, and, of course, the Black Sea? Yeah. I mean, there isn't um, a yes or no answer that I could give to that. There are examples of failure. Um, one of the bigger ones was the uh, Arab Spring protests. I mean, Turkey has, uh, back at that time, 2011, 2012, invested a lot of its kind of soft power narrative, saying that with its Turkish model of democracy and Islam and liberal economy, it could spread that model to all the countries that were at that time rebelling against the autocratic governments. If we look at it from today's perspective, well, none of that has really actually maintained its stance over there. I mean, the previous autocratic governments have come into power. Yeah. Syria has collapsed. You know, Egypt has reverted back. Uh, the Saudi states and everything, nothing has changed over there. So we can't say that anything has succeeded on that, uh, on that side. But if we look at soft power in terms of the Caucasus, I mean... Uh, never before have we seen a much closer alliance between Turkey and Azerbaijan. And through that close cooperation, the essential stability of the Caucasus. I mean, Turkey has reshaped the geopolitical kind of landscape of this region to a point where Russia has been suddenly excluded. Turkey is considered to be a key actor. Azerbaijan is considered to be a key ally of Turkey, something that was impossible to conceive 20 years ago when Azerbaijan was clearly on Russia's side. And a lot of that has to do with this kind of idea that Azerbaijan, Turkey, they're both Turkic states, they both have a shared narrative. Uh, and this is this element of soft power of that kind of cultural heritage. And we see something similar Turkey using, for example, in Central Asia. Sure, China and Russia are still the main actors over there. But when you look at, for example, support for politicians uh, in these countries, particularly for politicians abroad, uh, when they, you know, kind of try to model themselves, Erdogan is seen as one of those, you know, best people to kind of follow. And Turkey is seen as this ideal example yeah. uh, for these nations to follow. So there is absolutely a lot of soft power that Turkey can use. But that doesn't mean that, like in the case of the Middle East, that it's easy to implement. Yes, I mean, this is... Middle East is traditionally hugely difficult isn't exactly. it, to understate the, uh, the, the area. The, um, what is the, um, the attitude of the Western policy elite, make, policy making elite, to Turkey? Does it, see, does it take Turkey <clears throat> seriously as a, as a great regional power? Um, I think both the European Union and the United States do understand that Turkey's position um, the size, the role of its military in NATO makes Turkey, of course, an actor that they have to always consider and, you know, not treat as something that can be forgotten about, as, you know, as for granted. I mean, Turkey is uh, a significant uh, player in the West. And so mm, this is the one side of the argument. The other side is that, of course, Turkey, because of the fact that it considers to be a little bit more than just, you know, a, a, a ally of the West that it considers to be itself as a great actor that has something more to say rather than be pointed of what it should do. It, it does sometimes create for the West a lot of problems. We've seen it with Finland, with Sweden, the yes. prolonging of accession. Yeah. We see conflicts between Turkey and the United States, Turkey and Europe, the migration issues and stuff like that. And all of that creates this weird, this weird um, uh, codependence where Turkey is seen as both critical and at the same time sometimes annoying, sometimes, you know, painful to talk to. And so 
As for how much the West today considers Turkey to be a viable actor, I think that really depends on how each of these states is approaching. And I think that uh, there is absolutely potential for Turkey to be always considered fundamental, and I think that many states in, in West do consider it that, 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 that from this point of view. But at the same time, many leaders, as far as I look at the West, are very much tired with, with Erdogan's way of doing politics, and they want to have nothing to do with Turkey. And this is, I think, one of those issues, because Turkey, in my opinion, is too critical to be ignored. But at the same time, it's sometimes too hard to talk to it in order to, you know, accomplish something. Well, Adam Michalski, thank you very much for joining us. We'll have to uh, wind up the discussion there. But thanks very much for coming on to our programme. Thank you very much. That's all we have time for today. Join us next time on How We Got Here. <laughs>